Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, especially uh, in the wake of all of the momentous events that are going on in the world and in the US right now. We're really glad that you were all able to make some time to come here today to talk to us about uh, talk with us about this very important uh, topic. Uh, as many of you know, but some of you may not, my name is Maura Kremen. I am the president of Harvard Law Students for Life. Um, Harvard Law Students for Life is a student-run organization at Harvard Law School. We are a nonpartisan and religiously unaffiliated organization that aims to provide a community in which students can develop a pro-life approach to moral and legal questions and to advocate for pro-life perspectives in the broader law school community. And we're very uh, excited today to have one of our own, actually one of our founding members, Josh Craddock, here to talk to us today. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Ashley Vaughn to introduce Josh. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Vaughn. I'm the VP of Speakers for Harvard Students for Life. Josh Craddock is an affiliated scholar with the James Wilson Institute on Natural Rights and the American Founding. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where he served as the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. He later clerked for the Honorable Judge, uh, Judge Timothy Timkovich of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Prior to law school, Mr. Craddock managed advocacy teams for several nonprofit organizations at the United Nations and participated in negotiations on the Sustainable Development Goals. His writing has appeared in the Notre Dame Law Review, Harvard Journal on Legislation, the Tennessee Journal of Law and Policy, Newsweek, and National Review. And he is here to speak to us today. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mara and Ashley, for inviting me to come speak with you. It's always fun to uh, hear about the Harvard Law Students for Life group. Uh, as Mara mentioned, I was uh, one of the co-founding members back in uh, spring of 2016, and I'm just so glad to see that the work that you're doing on the Harvard Law School campus and for hosting events like this. So I'm excited to talk to you today about whether the 14th Amendment prohibits abortion. As most of you all know, this 1973 Supreme Court decision, Roe v. Wade, required states to allow abortion. And the seven men forming the majority said that the right to privacy includes a woman's decision to end the life of her preborn child, effectively through all nine months of pregnancy. That decision was widely criticized even by legal scholars who support abortion, but its central holding was reaffirmed in the 1992 decision, Casey versus Planned Parenthood. One of the defining questions of Justice Amy Coney Barrett's recent confirmation hearing was whether she would vote to overturn Roe. If any of you watched it, you probably saw that. I think it's unlikely, at least in the near future, if this term's June medical decision uh, is any indication. But I think Justice Barrett's confirmation does change the dynamic on the court, and suddenly the prospect is not unthinkable. It's worth considering what the legal landscape would look like if Roe were overturned. The conventional wisdom is that reversing Roe would simply return the issue of abortion to the states, and that each state would decide for itself whether to legalize or prohibit abortion. Even the late Justice Scalia held this view. He wrote in his Planned Parenthood versus Casey opinion that, quote, the Constitution says absolutely nothing about abortion. In his view, the 14th Amendment's guarantees of due process and equal protection for all persons did not encompass prenatal life. Instead, the question of abortion, he thought, should be decided state by state through the political process and democratic choice. In a 2008 interview, Justice Scalia said, quote, there are anti-abortion people who think that the Constitution requires a state to prohibit abortion. They say the Equal Protection Clause requires that you treat a helpless human being that's still in the womb the way you treat other human beings. I think that's wrong. I think that when the Constitution says that persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws, I think it clearly means walking around persons, end quote. So leave aside for a moment the observation that if the Constitution only protects walking around persons, it does, by implication, have something to say about abortion. The question I want to focus on is, does the Constitution really only protect walking around persons? Or is there a plausible counterargument based on the meaning of the term person as used in the 14th Amendment? I attempted to make that argument in my article published in Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy called Protecting Prenatal Persons. The structure of the argument is simple. The 14th Amendment's use of the word person guarantees due process and equal protection to all members of the human species within the geographic and jurisdictional power of the Constitution. 
the preborn are members of the human species from the moment of fertilization. Therefore, the 14th Amendment protects the preborn from fertilization. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down with the minor premise that preborn humans are biological members of the human species. But I'd like to stipulate that it is scientifically well established for, that unborn human beings are members of the species Homo sapiens from fertilization. You guys may have had recent uh, events talking about this, uh, but I'll point you to one recent survey of biologists that found that 95% of biologists agreed that human life begins at fertilization, regardless of their view on abortion. And that was widely known even before Roe v. Wade. For example, Dr. Bradley Patton of the Michigan Medical School writes in his 1964 Foundations of Embryology textbook, quote, the union of two such sex cells to form a zygote constitutes the process of fertilization and initiates the life of a new individual. As Dr. Matthews Roth of Harvard University Medical School later said, it's incorrect to say that biological data cannot be decisive. It is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception and that this developing human is always a member of our species in all stages of its life. But let's put a pin in that discussion and return to what this means for law. Regardless of what constitutional interpretive methodology you ascribe to, I think there's a compelling case that the 14th Amendment's protections extend to the unborn and that the Constitution in fact prohibits states from legalizing abortion. From a living constitutional perspective, the story of our Constitution is the story of expanding rights to more and more members of the human family based on our broadening notions and better understanding of human dignity and equality. On this view, the violence of abortion is incompatible with the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of a maturing society. In this talk, however, I'm primarily going to argue from an originalist perspective, which is to say on Justice Scalia's own terms. Why? Well, nearly half of the Supreme Court and most of the justices who are most likely to overturn Roe are to some degree originalists in their methodology. That is, they want to ascertain the original meaning of the constitutional text and apply it faithfully. So if you'll accept with me that minor premise that we discussed, that the preborn child in the womb is a member of the human species, all that must be demonstrated is that the term person in its original public meaning at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption applied to all members of the human species. I wanna draw on three strands of evidence to support that conclusion. First, dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption defined the terms person and human being interchangeably. The original public meaning of the term person included every member of the human race. And furthermore, the use of the term person in statutes and court cases referred specifically to the unborn in many instances. Second, centuries of common law precedent and state practice leading up to the 14th Amendment's adoption in 1868 indicates that the unborn were considered legal persons. And third, the authors of the 14th Amendment expected it to protect every human being, especially the weakest and most marginalized. That ex original expected application isn't conclusive of the original public meaning, but it is indicative and demonstrates that informed citizens believe that the text of the 14th Amendment applied to every human without exception. So I'll address each of these points in turn. First, let's start with the text. Dictionaries of common and legal usage at the time of the 14th Amendment's adoption treated the word person as interchangeable with human being or man, woman, child. For example, the 1864 edition of Noah Webster's Dictionary of the English Language defined the term person as relating, quote, especially to a living human being, a man, woman, or child. The entry for human includes those belonging to, quote, the race of man. No dictionary of the era referenced birth or the status of being born in its definition of person, man, or human being. In legal usage, the term person also had expansive scope. Alexander Burrell's New Law Dictionary and Glossary defined person as a human being considered as the subject of rights as distinguished from a thing. So a human being, not a thing. And that's consistent with Blackstone for whom there is no distinction between biological human life on the one hand and legal personhood on the other. As part of his discourse on the rights of persons in his authoritative commentaries on the laws of England, Blackstone wrote that natural persons are such as the God of nature formed us, 
echoing the words of the psalmist who wrote, you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Blackstone declared that life is a right inherent by nature in every individual, and it begins in contemplation of law as soon as an infant is able to stir in the mother's womb. Now, as I explained in my article, this mention of the unborn child's stirring was intended to protect prenatal life as soon as it could be discerned, not to exclude human life from protection prior to that point. So it's proper to derive the principle from Blackstone and other legal treatise writers that if human life could be shown to exist, legal personhood existed also. So with that background, we're now equipped to understand the meaning of the word as it was used in 1868. So let's look at specifically how it was used in the text of the 14th Amendment. So you might have it in front of you, but if not, the opening phrase of the amendment says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. So one thing that you'll notice is that it doesn't define the scope of the class persons. Rather, born or naturalized and subject to the jurisdiction thereof serve to narrow the broader class of persons to which the term refers down to its narrower subset, citizens. Prior to the adoption of the amendment, foreign nationals and Native Americans, for example, were considered legal persons. In fact, the term person has always been larger than its subset, citizen, and the Supreme Court's long-standing interpretation of the 14th Amendment in cases like Yikwo versus Hopkins reflects that traditional understanding. So when Justice Blackmun took an intratextual approach in Roe and concluded that the use of the uh, use of the word person has quote application only postnatally he was drawing an unsupported conclusion from the text basically what justice blackman did is he went through all the times that the word person is used elsewhere in the constitution to try to figure out what it meant in the 14th amendment but as Professor Akhil Amar at Yale Law School has pointed out in his article on intertextualism, it's very difficult to prove what a word couldn't mean through negative inferences only. So to illustrate the problem, you could draw an opposite and perhaps equally unsupported conclusion from the text through the use of the phrase persons born or naturalized in the citizenship clause that we discussed in section one. You could say that the adjective naturalized indicates that there are persons who are not naturalized and that if born functions the same way to limit the category of persons eligible for citizenship, it indicates that there are persons who are not born. I think that argument is just as defensible as the one that Justice Blackman makes, which is to say, not very defensible. But before I return to the next line of evidence, I want to point out that at this point, I think my case is proven. The term person in 1868 definitively included all human beings. And whether states historically believe that the preborn specifically were members of the human species doesn't actually matter, as long as they believed all human beings were entitled to protection under the 14th Amendment. So to borrow from Justice Scalia here, just as freedom of speech protects movies and internet communication under an originalist interpretation, even though those technologies didn't exist at the time of the First Amendment's adoption, person protects every member of the human species, regardless of whether individuals were recognized as members of the human family at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted. The meaning of the relevant text doesn't evolve, it's just applied to a new set of circumstances or new information. But as it turns out, the states did historically believe that the unborn were living members of the human family. And that we this me to my second line of evidence, which is the common law precedent and state practice on abortion. The English common law tradition, which the United States inherited and developed after its independence, consistently treated abortion as the wrongful killing of a human being. Abortion was prohibited as soon as life in the womb could be detected. Now, prior to the advent of modern medical science, preborn life was detected at quickening, that is the first perceived fetal movement. And that's what we discussed before from Lord Blackstone's commentaries. This was a useful evidentiary tool for determining whether the crime of abortion had actually occurred because there was great difficulty in proving that the child was alive prior to quickening. And proving that the child was in fact alive is necessary to prove the crime of abortion at common law. Legal giants such as uh, Lord Cook and Blackstone formalized the legal principles protecting prenatal life, which were eventually passed on to the American colonies and adopted into their state common law systems. 
Now, an embryologist discovered in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, that each human individual begins his or her life cycle of fertilization. The states rapidly discarded the old obsolete quickening standard in favor of a new medically accurate fertilization standard. For example, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled in 1850 that, quote, the moment the womb is instinct with embryo life and gestation has begun, the crime of abortion may be perpetrated. There was, therefore, a crime at common law. And that passage is indicative of the national mood regarding abortion in the era. The 1851 case, Smith v. State, from the Supreme Judicial Court of Maine, likewise upheld a statute that discarded the old quickening standard in favor of new information. By the time the 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, the states widely recognized unborn children as persons. 23 states and six territories referred to the fetus as a child in their anti-abortion statutes. 28 listed abortion among their statutory offenses against the person, or a functionally equivalent classification in their penal schemes. In a particularly striking example, the same Ohio legislature that ratified the 14th Amendment in January 1867 also passed legislation criminalizing abortion at all stages just three months later in April. The committee that reviewed the bill, which was composed of several senators who had voted for ratification of the amendment, declared in their report that abortion at any stage of existence is, quote, child murder. So strong words. Some scholars like Yale Law Professor Reva Siegel have suggested that this trend was motivated by concerns for women's health or distrust of women's reproductive choices, rather than from recognition of the preborn child's common humanity. And I think that view is inconsistent with the fact that the anti-abortion statutes during that period increased the penalty for abortion if it were proved to have caused the unborn child's death. And a majority of states did so irrespective of the age of gestation. Maine, among other states, deemed prosecution for abortion fatally de defective if it did not allege the destruction of the child. In any case, the historical context of abortion at common law and its treatment in the years just prior to the adoption of the 14th Amendment provides strong evidence that the public meaning of the term person included the preborn. The third line of evidence I want to briefly consider is the amendment's anticipated application. The framers of the amendment themselves certainly thought that their amendment required due process and equal protection of every human being. And while the intentions of the drafters of the amendment don't directly govern the meaning of the text, it's worth wondering whether this radically inclusive amendment could be reasonably interpreted to exclude a subset of individuals who in fact were considered human beings at the time it was written and who we now know better than ever to be part of the human family. The primary framer of the 14th Amendment, Representative John Bingham, believed the amendment prevented states from refusing, quote, any of the rights which pertain to common humanity. Senator Jacob Howard, who sponsored the amendment in the Senate, emphasized that the amendment guaranteed even the lowest and most despised members of the human race equal protection of the laws. And during the congressional debates, Representative John Br James Brown rhetorically asked, does the term person carry with it anything further than a simple allusion to the existence of the individual? The implicit answer is no. The drafters of the amendment carefully crafted the text to include all human beings within its juridical reach, regardless of their origin or circumstance. As Justice Hugo Black later put it, the history of the 14th Amendment proves that people were told that its purpose was to protect weak and helpless human beings. Their widely shared belief sheds, life, sheds light on the amendment's public meaning at the time of its adoption. The 14th Amendment was meant to be a new birth of freedom for all human beings. So what does all this mean for our current regime of abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy, as established in Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton? Well, in his Roe majority opinion, Justice Harry Blackman acknowledged that if personhood is established, the case for a constitutional right to abortion, quote, collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the amendment. Under an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, the edifice supporting Roe and its progeny crumbles. Given the original public meaning of the term person, the contemporaneous anti-abortion statute's purpose to protect prenatal life, 
and the public explanations given by the framers of the 14th Amendment as to its scope of meaning, the historical evidence supports extending protections to prenatal life on originalist grounds. You might be wondering though, where's the state action here? Because even if the unborn are included within the meaning of the term person, how could it be that there's any state action that would make the 14th Amendment applicable? As you know, especially if you've taken con law, a state's failure to protect an individual against private violence doesn't typically constitute a violation of the Due Process Clause. You might recall the DeShaney versus Winnebago County case as an example of this principle in action. But the DeShaney court qualified its holding by recognizing that the state may not, of course, selectively deny its protective services to certain disfavored minorities without violating the Equal Protection Clause. So let's take an example. If a state, as a matter of de facto or de jure policy, declined to apply its homicide laws when the victim is African American, but prosecuted homicide as usual when the victim is of other, some other ethnicity, that would be a clear equal protection violation. So if constitutional protections for the preborn were acknowledged, a state could not refuse to prosecute the intentional killing of the preborn while continuing to prosecute the killings of other classes of persons without violating the Equal Protection Clause. In light of the evidence, the Supreme Court should reverse course on abortion. But even if you're convinced of everything I've said so far, so what? Even with the addition of Justice Barrett, a minority of the current court is identifiably originalist in its interpretive method. And even those justices who ascribe to originalism may fear taking this bold approach. So in that case, What's the path forward for extending constitutional protections to the unborn? Well, I think every, every branch and level of government has a role to play here. First, Congress could act under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to enforce by appropriate legislation the Constitution's protections for preborn persons, such as through the Life at Conception Act. The executive should follow Lincoln's example to assert his departmental authority to interpret and uphold the Constitution. The president should fulfill his constitutional duty to, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. This may and should include, in my view, a rejection of judicial supremacy and the idea that Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. I don't want to get too bogged down deeply on this point because it's not the topic of my scholarship, but it occurs to me that the president swears an oath to pre preserve the Constitution of the United States and not every pronouncement of the Supreme Court. Finally, the states retain their primary duty to protect the inalienable rights of all human beings within their jurisdictions, the foremost of which is the right to life. States have a responsibility to exercise their police powers, that is their, their powers to promote public health, safety, and morals, to prohibit abortion. State governors and legislature, le legislators should do everything in their power to uphold the United States Constitution on this point. I think state personhood amendments and initiatives and the initiatives of other states are an encouraging trend in this direction, and I hope we continue to see that effort play out. Until the Supreme Court, the people or their elected representatives undo the caste system of separate and unequal treatment for preborn persons, there can be no true equal protection under the law. The legal regime that discriminates against preborn human beings should be abolished, restoring the harmony between science and law in a manner consistent with the Constitution. Well, thanks so much for allowing me to present that, and I, have, I will really look forward to hearing your questions. I'm sure that some of you have questions about this, and I guess I'll turn it over to Ashley and Mara now uh, to, to lead the Q&A. Thank you so much, Josh, for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, our first question is, do you think that there is a non-originalist justification for the unconstitutionality of allowing abortion? Yeah, thank you, Matt, for, for raising that. And I think I alluded to this briefly in the, uh, in the argument that I, I just made. And I think that the non-originalist argument looks at the history of our Constitution and the way we've progressively extended rights uh, and, and ensured that rights are extended to more and more classes of persons, especially the weak and the marginalized. So if you think about the extension of uh, voting rights to African Americans, the extension of voting rights to women, uh, I think that you can, you can craft a compelling narrative that based in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, built, you know, beginning with that foundation and, you know, looking at the history of our constitutional uh, story. And I think you can build a pretty strong argument for a non-originalist justification for the unconstitutionality of allowing abortion. I think there's also a Dworkinian argument uh, 
I think that that would fit in here, um, looking at the fit and justification for, for this sort of, you know, move. Um, another non-originalist argument would be a natural law argument. And I think that that argument could also start with the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the natural law argument would be, you know, that every person, uh, regardless of their present uh, capacity or power to exercise rationality, is a member of the human family, is a rational being. And on that basis, the, the, the state would protect uh, all human beings within its jurisdiction. So I appreciate the question. I think that's, uh, I think there are certainly non-originalist justifications. I think the reason I mostly focused on the originalist argument here is primarily to persuade those folks who are, uh, who consider themselves originalists, you know, people like Justice Scalia, who uh, would just assume that this issue would be returned to the states uh, on an originalist framework. And I, I guess I just don't see that that's the case under, if you actually look at the history. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is, in light of the census clause in Article 1, Section 2, what implication would your argument have for whether or not unborn persons would be considered persons in a national census? Great question. Okay, so Section 2 uh, says that, I'll, I'll just read it for everyone. Some of you guys may not be familiar, but uh, I'm sure that all of the law students are, but Section 2 says that representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. So the question is, okay, well, if they're persons in section one, what about in section two, would they be counted in the census? Well, a baby born prematurely at seven months is counted, right, since it's been born, but a baby in the womb at nine months isn't counted right now, even though it is older, maybe healthier, and just as much of a person as the prematurely born child. So as I understand it, uh, there are forms in many states that are updated several months after the federal census date and that are included in the count as long as they include persons that were alive on census day. So I, I think that that could apply here. I also think, you know, we, we know that it's true that some preborn, you know, I think the argument against this, right, is that some preborn lives may end early in miscarriage or abortion or stillbirth, um, and so they shouldn't be counted. But I'm not persuaded by that argument because, I mean, you think about the many adults in hospice care, right, who are expected to die uh, imminently, but but they're still counted. Uh, so if a preborn child is alive on census day, I think that there's a strong textual argument that they should be counted. And lastly, I, I mean, the, there's also a policy argument here because, uh, you know, obviously the census, uh, since counting for the census is to, uh, to apportion representation. Representation, right, is designed to, uh, you know, we wanna make sure that there are appropriate services and representation in, in Congress to make sure that things are happening in a district that reflect the full number of persons within that district. And I think artificially excluding the preborn from that count, who are going to be born, right, within the next few months, um, it makes policy sense to include them because we want to make sure that we're accurately reflecting those persons, uh, the families, the children, uh, the parents, in that district when we're apportioning representatives. So I think that there's, on a textual argument, I think you would count uh, preborn children. Uh, I think that it makes sense, and for some of the reasons I described, it makes policy sense as well. Um, but as far as I know, it hasn't been done in the past. And I think that's an interesting question. There, there have been a few cases that have gone to district court uh, questioning this issue about whether the preborn should be counted in, in the apportionment clause. And unfortunately, those were those district court opinions were decided after Roe. And so the district court just said, well, look at Roe, uh, they're not counted. So I wonder if we took Roe out of the picture, I think that there's actually a strong argument that they should be counted under section two. But that, I think it's a really fascinating question. I thank you for raising it. Yeah, those were some really great, great points you made. Um, you briefly alluded to this in your previous answer, uh, the issue of miscarrying, but we had somebody ask prior to the event, um, you know, we've seen laws where if a pregnant woman is murdered, there are implications for the, the criminal based on whether or not she was pregnant. And then we also saw in New York, they changed that law to make it so that there are no more implications for if she's pregnant and she's murdered. Does your definition, uh, does your constitutional definition of personhood affect those laws and the criminal um, results for uh, people who are murdered or who are pregnant and things like that. Yeah, so you're talking about fetal homicide laws, which are on the books in a majority of states. And uh, obviously we also have the federal uh, uh, federal law concerning uh, fetal homicide. So I think under the existing abortion jurisprudence, there's a real tension between 
the laws on the one hand that recognize that if a pregnant woman is murdered, that uh, both the woman and her child are victims and that the criminal should be charged and punished for taking both lives. And the abortion jurisprudence that says that, well, actually this, this uh, human entity in the womb is not a person. And if we, you know, if an abortionist uh, kills the child, then there's no crime there. There's no, pun you know, there's no, um, no consequences for that. And so I think that the existing regime has, has a real tension there. And I think that this interpretation of the constitution that would recognize the unborn as persons would actually bring those two strands into line and recognize, you know, make a lot more sense of the, what we recognize in the fetal homicide context that when a woman, a pregnant woman is murdered, that there are two victims and that the, the, that the person is actually, you know, more culpable and that's an aggravating factor that should be considered uh, for, for a criminal like that. Awesome. Thank you. Does so that much. answer your question? I yes. hopefully that. Okay. That was really helpful. Thank you. Um, in your talk, you did talk about the the common law, uh, the common law understanding of abortion and uh, this idea of quickening. And yeah. so um, prior to sort of the 1860s, they didn't make it illegal until quickening happened. But what did they think was happening when they, you know, induced menses or did an abortion, I guess, before quickening, because if abortion is killing a child, then it may not be considered that prior to quickening. So I'm curious what you, what your take is on that. Yeah. So the quickening rule developed. That's a it's a great question. It's something that the Roe Court uh, tried to bring in as well as an argument for why, uh, you know, abortion had not been prohibited. They tried to argue that abortion had not really been prohibited at common law and that it was considered one of the liberties implicit in the Fourteenth Amendment. And so when you when you actually look at the record and or look at the the history of this, uh, the quickening standard developed as an evidentiary rule. So uh, the part of one of the elements to the crime of abortion at common law was the taking of the unborn life, and you'd have to have some sort of evidence or uh, proof that 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 the child was actually alive and not, uh, for example. Uh, you know, still basically still born in the womb, right? Uh, that the, the child was actually alive when the abortion took place. And that this is uh, not just, you know, inducing miscarriage after a child has already died or something like that. And so that was the purpose of the quickening rule is to show that there actually was a living child in there and that you could actually satisfy that element of taking the unborn child's life to prove the crime of abortion at common law. So that was the his old historical rule going back to like the 12, 1300s in England, actually. Um, as it developed and, and uh, you know, was established in the United States, and as I described in the early 1800s, 1830s, in basically in that period between like the mid-1820s up to the 1860s, all of these states, in light of the new medical evidence showing uh, life beginning at fertilization and also showing that like you could actually uh, prove that the child was alive prior to quickening, uh, in light of that new information, they started discarding the quickening standard. Uh, of, a, a majority of them did so in recognition of the fact that the child was alive in the womb prior to quickening, uh, whereas previous to that, it, hadn't, it was difficult to prove that that was actually true. Um, the last thing I'll say is that Clark Forsyth has written uh, pretty interesting uh, information and analysis of this history, uh, both on regarding the quickening rule and on the uh, born alive rule, which was a minority rule uh, at common law in some jurisdictions and became a majority rule in some other commonwealth uh, countries like New Zealand and I believe Australia. Um, so he's written about that as well, describing how that was also an evidentiary rule that was even more um, conservative, I suppose, uh, about what you would need to prove to prove the crime of abortion. But I would definitely refer you to his work on that. I believe there's a law, law review article that he's written on the Born Alive rule, and that addresses quickening as well. So check out Clark Forsyth's uh, work on that one. Thank you. That sounds great. Um, as I'm sure you know, last night, Louisiana passed Amendment 1, which adds language to their Declaration of Rights that says there's nothing in their state's constitution that shall be construed to secure or protect a right to abortion or requiring the funding of abortion. I looked it up just to make sure it was precise. I'm curious what you think the implications are for this, um, depending on the, the new composition of the court or the future of abortion jurisprudence. Yeah, I was really excited to see that result in Louisiana. And I think it's interesting. So there, if you suppose that, uh, you know, if Roe is overturned and supposing it's just returned to the states and, and that the court doesn't in the process of overturning Roe find that the unborn child is, has a guaranteed right to life uh, under the 14th Amendment. I think an amendment 
a state amendment like this is very helpful because it specifically is finding that there's nothing in the state constitution that should be construed to, con to secure a right to abortion or require the funding of abortion. Because we've seen in many states, so for example, uh, the state of Kansas, uh, I believe it was about a year ago, interpreted its state constitution to protect a right to abortion. So not only the federal constitution uh, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, but also their state constitution as protecting a natural right to abortion. And uh, I think that this Louisiana amendment is kind of in response to those sort of uh, moves to try and protect abortion or guarantee abortion under state constitutional law in the event that Roe is overturned. I think that the people of Louisiana rightly uh, determined that they didn't want their state constitution to be interpreted that way and that if Roe is overturned they want to make sure that there's nothing in their state constitution that would require them uh, to, to uh, allow abortion within their state. So. I think it's exciting. It's a good. It's a good indication, and hopefully, we see other states do that. I know that other states, many states, have passed uh, legislation to this effect as well, saying that basically, if if Roe were overturned and returned to the states, that uh, in the event that happened, their state law would Im immediately prohibit abortion according to their state codes. So this is similar, but on a constitution, state constitutional level. Definitely. Um, I think we have one final question. What are the practical steps towards advancing this argument, whether it's towards our friends who are originalists or towards our friends who, who don't agree with that perspective? What should we do to um, just advance this argument? Yeah, well, I, I, some of the folks that I've talked to who are interested in this are writing uh, papers on it uh, for their law, law journal or law review notes. Uh, so some people are writing based on their state constitutions. A friend of mine from Georgia uh, took a lot of this information and started going to the original meaning of the Georgia Constitution and what what, what did that uh, actually protect? What was the mean of the term person as used in the Georgia Constitution, uh, after, both before and after Reconstruction? Uh, so I think that there's some really interesting work to be done in that area. Um, I think that, so, you know, continuing to write and uh, write articles and law, law review uh, pieces on this topic is really important and helps move the conversation. Uh, I also think just being, you know, sharing with your friends that this is an option on the table because a lot of people say, well, if abortion is, or Roe v. Wade is overturned, it'll just send abortion back to the states. And I always say, well, that's, that's probably the most likely scenario, but that's not necessarily true because the court could find uh, the right to life is actually protected by the 14th Amendment. And so I think it's interesting to always uh, mention that and bring it up in conversation. Uh, so in addition to writing about it, uh, talking about it with your friends, um, I think that uh, this, another good thing about this argument is that I think it really does refocus us on what the, uh, what the American Constitution and what our Declaration, uh, which Abraham Lincoln called the golden apple, right, within the frame of silver of the Constitution, what our Declaration and Constitution really mean when they say that, uh, you know, the, how the Constitution secures the Declaration's declaration that all men are created equal. How does the Constitution do that? And I think that this argument gives context uh, to, to that point, showing how the Declaration and Constitution are actually entirely consistent on this point, and how the 14th Amendment is actually ensuring that that Declaration's axiom is uh, enshrined in our national basic law. So. I think that's the best answer I can give you there. Yeah, that's awesome. And we actually do have one more question. Um, Great. How do you think the implication of fetal personhood will affect the cases of where the mother's life is at stake and you have to choose between two rights to life? Right. Yeah, that's so that's a great question. I was hoping that uh, someone would bring that up. So th basically the question is what you know, what do you do in the case of uh, where a woman's health or life is at risk. So I think first we want to look at let's the first thing I want to say is let's look let's I want to address the existing law on uh, the health exception. And then secondly, I want to address whether abortion is ever medically necessary. So for on the first point. Uh, the companion case to Roe v. Wade, which is Doe versus Bolton, basically established a health exception uh, for abortion, guaranteeing abortion in the third trimester for a woman's health, when a woman's health is at risk. But the way that the Doe v. Bolton court did that it actually has a, uh, it's not a narrow health exception, it's a very broad health exception. So it includes anything that could include, you know, psychological or emotional trauma, anything that would basically, if you would feel anxiety, if you were not allowed to obtain an abortion, that would qualify 
qualify as within the health exception as created by Doe v. Bolton. So that's why when a lot of uh, people who want to protect the right to life say that abortion under Roe is, uh, allows abortion through all nine months of pregnancy, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about that health exception that you could drive a truck through, that basically anything qualifies. And there are even a few examples of this, uh, the, the late abortionist um, uh, in, in uh, Wichita, Kansas, was known, he, had, he was known to have de performed abortions because women had anxiety that they wouldn't be able to uh, continue their rodeo career in the, in the eighth and ninth month of pregnancy. Uh, and the, he qualified that as the, that anxiety qualified under the health exception of, of Doe. So that's, so that's the context of the health exception as it exists in current law. So then to answer the question specifically, what do you do if we did recognize the unborn as persons? Well, what about, you know, true, you know, cases where the woman's health is at risk, uh, should, you know, the, the life of the, the, the life of the mother, that sort of thing. And I have two answers to that. First, I would ref refer people to the Dublin Declaration on Maternal Health Care. And basically in 2012, uh, a lot of world-renowned experts in obstetrics and gynecology, they came together and issued a declaration explaining that direct abortion, meaning the purposeful and intentional direct uh, destruction of the unborn child, is never medically necessary to save the life of a woman. And so they analyzed and looked at cases of ectopic pregnancy, cancer treatment in pregnancy, all sorts of scenarios. And they affirmed that quote, the fundamental difference between abortion and the necessary medical treatments that are carried out to save the life of a mother, even if such treatment results in the life, uh, uh, loss of life of her unborn child. So basically they're distinguishing between an abortion, which is going in and directly, uh, you know, vacuum aspirating, dismembering a child, and premature delivery or something like that, you know, removing the child from the womb, even if we know that the child won't survive or, per, you know, performing chemotherapy, even if we know that that means that the child, uh, you know, is very likely to not survive. Uh, basically distinguishing between those two things. And that statement from the Dublin Declaration has actually been signed by nearly a thousand OBGYN doctors, as well as other medical professionals. And if you go today to uh, the Dublin Declaration.com uh, or the International Symposium on Maternal Health Care, which was uh, connected with the Dublin Declaration, you can watch any number of videos from these experts explaining how they would approach treatment of, uh, you know, in these difficult cases of ectopic pregnancy or cancer treatment in pregnancy and that sort of thing. So that's the first part. And then the second part is uh, a comparative law example. And the comparative law actually disproves that there are medically necessary abortions. Uh, there's a few examples of this. So for years, Ireland was among the top three safest countries in the world for pregnant mothers and had the lowest rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. And they accomplished that while maintaining a total ban on abortion until very recently. And Chile is another example. It had the second lowest rate of maternal mortality in the Americas, better than the US, while maintaining a total abortion ban. And lastly, Malta, with its total abortion ban, has one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. So if you look at the comparative law, there's actually no conflict between protecting the right to life of the preborn and protecting the health of the mother. So uh, I would argue that in many, most cases, this is actually a false dichotomy and it's a little bit of slippage when we're using the term abortion to describe medically necessary treatments to that try and treat both patients and try and uh, you know love them both to care for both patients and you know, ensure, try and maximize the survival of both patients. Uh, but in some cases, that's not always going to be possible. And that's a tragedy, but it's not an abortion. Thank you so much. That's really great information to have and um, really helpful. So thank you so much for speaking to us today. I think Maura is going to jump in real quick and give her thanks as well. Yep. Uh, thank you, Ashley. And thank you, Josh. I just want to um, say how great this talk was. We had a, a wonderful attendance and I think was very, very well received. Thank you to all of you who came, who listened to the talk and who asked really great questions. Um, and we look forward to having you at some of our future Students for Life events as well. All right. Thank you guys so much. See you later. Thank both of you.